I've got eight random questions here. You get three rolls on the tower and whatever you roll, that's what we start with at least. Eight is game show. If you could be on the game show of your choice, what show would you pick and could you actually win it? I might be on Survivor if that's considered a game oh, show. Oh, you can count Survivor. I might be on that show or The Amazing Race. Those are, I would love, both of them are seem like such an adventure. It's just like something that would change your life, you know? It seems like such an extraordinary experience. Oh, it would just be so cool. I'm never going to choose electively to put myself on a, uh, you know, an island with no food or fresh water <laughs> or shelter. Um, so, you know, it would be an experience that I think I would only have if I had gone on the show, I guess. Suicide Squad role swap. If you could swap roles with anyone on this show or in that movie, who would you pick and why? I mean, I probably would pick Harley Quinn because Margot Robbie played her so well that she made her such an extraordinary character. So she just seems like the most fun, weird character to play. Fair enough, fair How enough, I you? like that choice. What would you choose? I'm an animal lover, so I think I have to pick Ratcatcher. Ooh, yeah, she's a great character. Seven is movie and TV skills. If you could learn a new skill or about a different profession through a role, what would it be? Astronomy or theoretical physics or anything in that realm. If I could, you know, go hang out with the people at like JPL and get to know what they do, uh, I think that would be so exciting for me. I'm kind of a nerd about, uh, astronomy and the universe and like I want to know where we are and why we're here and I have all these questions so um, uh, I think what those people do is so cool I probably love to, to, to have like a day in the life I want you to put the cast of Peacemaker in a horror movie so I'm gonna give you some like horror movie uh, I guess superlatives and you tell me who best fits this description and why okay all right who of the cast is most likely to not realize they're in a horror movie and go and investigate a strange noise? I think I would say it would be Lachlan Monroe, who plays Fitzgibbon on the show, who's sort of the Abbott and Costello police team. He's like one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. And there's something about him that feels like he, he just sort of, he just, yeah, he would probably take one for the team and go and investigate. And yeah, I don't know. He, he's, he's just such a nice guy. Who is the first one to figure out who the killer actually is? I think it's most likely Chikuti. He's a critical thinker. Who is the most likely to be the last one standing? You know, I think it'd probably be Freddy Stroma. He has this sort of a uh, quiet aspect to him that he do he's not trying to like be the loudest person in the room or be seen. He's, he's very much, uh, you know, he's, I wouldn't say he's quiet, but he's a little more quiet than everyone else. So I feel like he'd slip under the radar. Who is the most likely to be the one that you think is dead, but is actually alive and comes back at the last minute to save the day? I feel like it has to be John Cena. I mean, it just has to be. It's, it's basically what happened to his character in Suicide Squad. So it just feels right. <laughs> Fair enough. Wait, now I have to throw you in the mix here. What horror movie cliche are you? Where do you fall in like the typical the typical group there? Oh gosh. Um I don't know. I'm probably the dumb blonde who runs up the stairs and gets murdered at the beginning of the I don't know. The screen <laughs> franchise was very much justified that sometimes that's your only option though. That's true, that's true. Um, I don't know. I think that I, I would like to believe I'm I, I'm really smart and I could I could outwit the killer, but you know, I don't know. I, I don't know it's if I have that, that drive and that belief in yourself that matters and you have that. There you go. Yeah, I like <laughs> that you believe in me. You have belief in I me. I do. And that, that makes me think that I would be the most likely to live at the end. You are lovely to talk to and I just watched you kick ass for seven episodes. Why wouldn't I believe in you? Hello everyone, welcome back for another episode of Collider Ladies Night. I am starting off my 2022 strong because you all know that I love Scream and I just had a Scream guest on and now I love Peacemaker and I have Jennifer Holland on the show. Congratulations. I love this show so, so much. 
Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. You hit the point where you say, I want this to be my career. What is the very first step you take at that point? Is it kind of, you know, the traditional audition grind until something hits? Well, I was living in Florida. I was 16 years old and I went to a convention, which was basically like a bunch of agents and managers went into this big auditorium to uh, watch a bunch of actors and models walk down a runway and then they would decide whether or not they uh, wanted to rep you. Um, and you'd get a call back from, from those people. It was a very weird experience. As a 16 year old, I had no idea that it was as weird as it is. Cause I don't think those things really happen anymore today. But, That's the um, first I've ever heard of something like that. <laughs> yeah, it was very, it was, it was, it was cool because, you know, they would go around the country and scout out uh, talent. And so I, I had to stand up on this big, enormous stage by myself and do a monologue in front of this like panel of judges, basically, because there was just like agents and managers out there watching my m monologue. Yeah, I don't know. I, I did it. I got some callbacks and people wanted to, to, to represent me. And they were like, you've got to get out here by pilot season. And so I kind of just picked up my whole life um, right before my 17th birthday and moved out to California. And it was nothing at all like what I imagined it would be. I I came out and met the guy who told me to move out to, to California, whose name I, I shall not mention. And I sat down with him at my first meeting after I got to California and, and he said, where did I meet you? And I was like, oh. um, Florida, we were, it was, it was the, and you said that you, and, and I moved out my whole life from, uh, um, and, and he was like, well, I, I don't know that there's a place for you here, but uh, you know, you're welcome to, to take acting class for a little while and we can kind of see where it goes. He taught um, free acting class to all of his clients. He was a manager. And, um, and so I was like, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll take acting class. And I started taking acting class uh, like seven days a week. And, you know, knowing him now and who I started to get to know over the years, I think that it was uh, sort of his, he, he just, he tests actors all the time. He's always trying to make sure that they know that it's not as easy of a, of a career as you might think it is. And you're not just going to waltz in here and get a job or whatever. So it could have been, he could have maybe just not remembered me at all, or maybe he was trying to test me to see how, uh, how much, you know, I was really wanting to do this. How do you kind of get over that shock of going out there and having that conversation? And I guess like not feeling dejected and thinking to yourself, well, not like I made the wrong decision. I must run in another direction. You know, there was a part of me that was, so, I was such a smart, intuitive kid, there was a part of me that really knew that that was it, that I was hurt by it. It really, really hurt me. Um, and I felt so dejected, but there was another part of me that was like, well, he said that I can come take free acting class. So obviously he wants to work with me, you know? Uh, so, um, I just kind of forged ahead. Let's talk a little bit about your collaboration with James now. When did you first discover that he was an ideal actor's director for you? Someone whose writing and directing really enhanced your own craft? I think I I found his, his appeal as a director when I was, when I would get to watch him work, uh, when I, before I ever worked with him, I would sit on set of like uh, Guardians 2 or, or what have you and just getting to watch the way he works, the way he uh, tries different things or, uh, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll get someone to do something over and over and over and over again because he's really um, looking for something specific or because he's wanting to, to tear you down to a point, not tear you down, but like strip you down to a point where, um, you know, you're just raw and you're just more real and all of the things that he, I think does, does for people. And he has such a very specific idea of what he wants. So um, it's really easy to sort of put yourself in his hands, so to speak, and, and trust him. And he's just fun. He's just a fun guy to work with. You know, he gets testy and he's very particular about the things that he likes, but at his core, he's just having a good time on set. And so he creates a really great atmosphere um, that feels like a safe place to 
try new things. I think this particular line might have happened in like episode four or something. But at one point she says, here I am living the dream. And the delivery makes it feel to me like the dream has faded for her. So if that is the case, what did the original dream look like when she first got into this line of work? She alludes to some degree that uh, her father sort of got her into this line of work. Um, and so I think it remains to be seen exactly what all of that looks like. But for my own personal explanation of who the character is and the backstory that I created for her, I think that she idolized her father to some degree and she she saw him as sort of this, this uh, superhuman uh, person. And, uh, and she wanted to, and she wanted to do what he did. Um, I think she, she probably didn't know uh, all of the baggage and everything that came that came along with that. If I'm correct, I believe James directed the first three episodes. So what was it like jumping on to the set with a different director, which I guess would mark the first time you played this character for another director? Uh, the first director who came on was Jody Hill. He was a joy to work with. He was just awesome. He sets a high bar for himself, I think. And uh, really, he has a lot of integrity and I think he wants to do a good job. And as a, as a guy who's a, a creator himself, he's not just a sort of a gun for hire. He, um, you know, dove into this thing that, that James created and, and really just um, gave it his all. I feel like in the same way that he would any other project that he's working on. So uh, it was great to work with Jody. Uh, he, he really understood probably more than uh, all of the rest of the directors, for sure. I think he really just got the tone of the show and the sort of um, balance between comedy and drama and how to keep that really uh, grounded. I feel like literally every single time I've seen anything James has done, one of my big takeaways is I can't see any other director being able to tell this story the same way. So the fact that you guys were able to assemble a team of directors to uphold what he establishes is really, really impressive. Well, let me be clear. James is very uh, involved. He directed a lot of one of the episodes just purely because of having to do reshoots. I will give all of the directors high accolades for being able to mold themselves to James's a very specific vision, you know, because he sees things in his brain so clearly. And then he that's why he's able to um, then turn them into reality. I think it's really always, it's difficult for him to convey that to someone else and try to get the same outcome. Um, so I think everyone did a great job at succeeding at that. I have to ask you about working with John also, because you don't really, you don't share any scenes in the Suicide Squad. So was there anything about the way that he approached the role and the work that really surprised you when you hit this set? He's just a consummate professional. John is always prepared. He's almost always the first person on set and the last person to leave. And he comes to set with just absolute uh, dedication and sets the bar for everyone else really high. So I didn't know what to expect. I had met John during the filming of The Suicide Squad, but I had not gotten to work with him. So in that sense, I didn't know what to expect, but he completely surprised me in his both um, his incredible, uh, his work ethic, this incredible work ethic that he has. Uh, but also he is such a, a, a much more deep grounded and down to earth person than I think you'd ever know from seeing this sort of larger than life person that he is as a celebrity. He is just, um, he's so into self uh, improvement, uh, learning. He seems like he's always learning something new. Uh, and I learned a lot from him in that, in that sense, because he, he's this guy who is really at the top of his game. He's accomplished so much and it's not a place in most people's life where they would look at themselves and go, what can I change here? How can I be better? Um, and that's kind of, who he is is just kind of always trying to be better and learn new things and 
be a more well-rounded person. And he's always trying to have more empathy for people. And he's just such a great guy. I'm like, are you a human being? <laughs> I got to let you go. But again, huge congratulations on Peacemaker. And I've got very high hopes for this series. So hopefully we can reconnect as it continues on and on and I on. I would love yeah. that. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.